Biblical cosmology is the biblical writer's conception of the cosmos as an organized, structured entity, including its origin, order, meaning and destiny. The Bible was formed over many centuries, involving many authors, and reflects shifting patterns of religious belief, consequently, its cosmology is not always consistent. Nor do the biblical texts necessarily represent the beliefs of all Jews or Christians at the time they were put into writing. The majority of those making up Hebrew Bible or Old Testament in particular represent the beliefs of only a small segment of the ancient Israelite community, the members of a late Judean religious tradition centered in Jerusalem and devoted to the exclusive worship of Yahweh. The ancient Israelites envisaged a universe made up of a flat disk shaped earth floating on water, heaven above, under world below. Humans inhabited Earth during life and the underworld after death, and the underworld was morally neutral. Only in Hellenistic times after C. BCE did Jews begin to adopt the Greek idea that it would be a place of punishment for misdeeds, and that the righteous would enjoy an afterlife in heaven. In this period too the older three-level cosmology in large measure gave way to the Greek concept of a spherical earth suspended in space at the center of a number of concentric heavens. The opening words of the Genesis creation narrative Genesis chapter 1 verses 1 to 26 sum up a view of how the cosmos originated. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Yahweh, the God of Israel, was solely responsible for creation and had no rivals. Later Jewish thinkers, adopting ideas from Greek philosophy, concluded that God's wisdom, word and spirit penetrated all things and gave them unity. Christianity in turn adopted these ideas and identified Jesus with the Logos word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. John chapter 1 verse 1. Topic. Cosmogony Origins of the Cosmos Topic <inaudible> <inaudible> Divine Battle and Divine Speech Two different models of the process of creation existed in ancient Israel in the logos Speech model, God speaks and shapes unresisting dormant matter into effective existence and order Psalm chapter 33. By the word of YHWH the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their hosts, he gathers up the waters like a mound, stores the deep in vaults. In the second, or agon, struggle model, God does battle with the monsters of the sea at the beginning of the world in order to mark his sovereignty and power. Psalm chapter 74 evokes the Agon model, it opens with a lament over God's desertion of his people and their tribulations, then asks him to remember his past deeds. You it was who smashed sea with your might, who batted the heads of the monsters in the waters, you it was who crushed the heads of Leviathan, who left them for food for the denizens of the desert. In this world view the seas are primordial forces of disorder, and the work of creation is preceded by a divine combat or theomachy. Creation in the Agon model takes the following storyline, 1 God as the divine warrior battles the monsters of chaos, who include sea, death, tannin and leviathan, 2 the world of nature joins in the battle and the chaos monsters are defeated, 3 God is enthroned on a divine mountain, surrounded by lesser deities, 4 he speaks, and nature brings forth the created world, or for the Greeks, the cosmos. This myth was taken up in later Jewish and Christian apocalyptic literature and projected into the future, so that cosmic battle becomes the decisive act at the end of the world's history. Thus the book of Revelation end of the first century CE tells how, after the gods' final victory over the sea monsters, new heavens and new earth shall be inaugurated in a cosmos in which there will be no more sea. Revelation chapter 21 verse 1, the Genesis creation narrative Genesis chapter 1 is the quintessential logos creation myth. Like the agon model it begins with darkness and the uncreated primordial ocean, God separates and restrains the waters, but he does not create them from nothing. 
God initiates each creative act with a spoken word. God said, let there be. And finalizes it with the giving of a name. Creation by speech is not unique to the Old Testament, it is prominent in some Egyptian traditions. There is, however, a difference between the Egyptian and Hebrew Logos mythologies. In Genesis chapter 1, the divine word of the Elohim is an act of making into the word of Egyptian creator God, by contrast, is an almost magical activation of something inherent in pre-creation, as such, it goes beyond the concept of fiat divine act to something more like the logos of the Gospel of John. <laughs> Naming, God, Wisdom, Torah and Christ In the ancient world, things did not exist until they were named. The name of a living being or an object was the very essence of what was defined, and the pronouncing of a name was to create what was spoken. The pre-exilic before 586 BCE Old Testament allowed no equals to Yahweh in heaven, despite the continued existence of an assembly of subordinate servant deities who helped make decisions about matters on heaven and earth. The post-exilic writers of the wisdom tradition, e.g., the Book of Proverbs, Song of Songs, etc., developed the idea that wisdom, later identified with Torah, existed before creation and was used by God to create the universe. Present from the beginning, wisdom assumes the role of master builder while God establishes the heavens, restricts the chaotic waters, and shapes the mountains and fields. Borrowing ideas from Greek philosophers who held that reason bound the universe together, the wisdom tradition taught that God's wisdom, word and spirit were the ground of cosmic unity. Christianity in turn adopted these ideas and applied them to Jesus. The epistle to the Colossians calls Jesus image of the invisible God, firstborn of all creation. While the Gospel of John identifies him with the creative word, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Topic: Cosmography, shape and structure of the cosmos. Topic: <laughs> Heavens, Earth, and Underworld. The Hebrew Bible depicted a three-part world, with the heavens, Shamayim, above, Earth, Eris, in the middle, and the underworld, Sheol, below. After the 4th century BCE this was gradually replaced by a Greek scientific cosmology of a spherical Earth surrounded by multiple concentric heavens. The Cosmic Ocean The three-part world of heavens, earth and underworld floated in Tahom, the mythological cosmic ocean, which covered the earth until God created the firmament to divide it into upper and lower portions and reveal the dry land. The world has been protected from the cosmic ocean ever since by the solid dome of the firmament. The Tahom is, or was, hostile to God. It confronted him at the beginning of the world, Psalm chapter 104 verse 6 ff, but fled from the dry land at his rebuke. He has now set a boundary or bar for it which it can no longer pass Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 22 and Job chapter 38 verses 8 to 10 The cosmic sea is the home of monsters which God conquers by his power he stilled the sea by his understanding he smote Rahab Job chapter 26 verse 12 f, Rahab is an exclusively Hebrew sea monster, others, including Leviathan and the Tannin, or dragons, are found in Ugaritic texts, it is not entirely clear whether they are identical with sea or a sea's helpers. The bronze sea, which stood in the forecourt of the temple in Jerusalem probably corresponds to the sea 
In Babylonian temples, representing the APSU, the cosmic ocean, in the New Testament Jesus's conquest of the stormy sea shows the conquering deity overwhelming the forces of chaos, a mere word of command from the Son of God stills the foe Mark chapter 4 verses 35 to 41, who then tramples over his enemy, Jesus walking on water, Mark chapter 6 verse 45, 47 to 51. In Revelation, where the archangel Michael expels the dragon Satan from heaven, and war broke out in heaven, with Michael and his angels attacking the dragon. Revelation chapter 12 verse 7, the motif can be traced back to Leviathan in Israel and to Tiamat, the chaos ocean, in Babylonian myth, identified with Satan via an interpretation of the serpent in Eden. Heavens <laughs> Form and structure In the Old Testament the word Shammayim represented both the sky, atmosphere, and the dwelling place of God. The rachia or firmament, the visible sky, was a solid inverted bowl over the earth, colored blue from the heavenly ocean above it. Rain, snow, wind and hail were kept in storehouses outside the Ratchir, which had windows to allow them in. The waters for Noah's flood entered when the windows of heaven were opened. Heaven extended down to and was coterminous with i.e. it touched the farthest edges of the earth e.g. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 32, humans looking up from earth saw the floor of heaven, which they saw also as God's throne, as made of clear blue lapis lazuli Exodus chapter 24 verses 9 to 10, and Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 26. Below that was a layer of water, the source of rain, which was separated from us by an impenetrable barrier, the firmament Genesis chapter 1 verses 6 to 8. The rain may also be stored in heavenly cisterns, Job 38 to 37, or storehouses, Doi 28 to 12, alongside the storehouses for wind, hail, and snow. Grammatically, the word shamayim can be either dual two or plural more than two, without ruling out the singular one. As a result, it is not clear whether there were one, two, or more heavens in the Old Testament, but most likely there was only one. And phrases such as heaven of heavens were meant to stress the vastness of god's realm the babylonians had a more complex idea of heaven and during the babylonian exile 6th century bce the influence of babylonian cosmology led to the idea of a plurality of heavens among jews this continued into the new testament revelation apparently has only one heaven but the epistle to the hebrews and the epistles to the colossians and the ephesians have more than one although they don't specify how many and the apostle paul tells of his visit to the third heaven the place according to contemporary thought where the garden of paradise is to be found topic god and the heavenly beings Israel and Judah, like other Canaanite kingdoms, originally had a full pantheon of gods. The chief of the old Canaanite pantheon was the god El, but over time Yahweh replaced him as the national god and the two merged. Yahweh El, creator of heaven and earth. Genesis chapter 14 verse 22. The remaining gods were now subject to Yahweh. Who in the sky is comparable to Yahweh, like Yahweh among the divine beings? A God dreaded in the council of holy beings. Psalm chapter 89 verses 6 to 9. In the book of Job the council of heaven, the sons of God Elohim, meet in heaven to review events on earth and decide the fate of Job. One of their number is the Satan, literally the accuser. Who travels over the earth much like a Persian imperial spy? Job dates from the period of the Persian Empire, reporting on, and testing, the loyalty of men to God. The heavenly bodies, the heavenly host, sun, moon, and stars were worshipped as deities, a practice which the Bible disapproves and of which righteous Job protests his innocence. If I have looked at the sun when it shone, or the moon, 
and my mouth has kissed my hand, this also would be an iniquity. Belief in the divinity of the heavenly bodies explains a passage in Joshua chapter 10 verse 12, usually translated as Joshua asking the sun and moon to stand still, but in fact Joshua utters an incantation to ensure that the sun god and moon god, who supported his enemies, would not provide them with oracles. In the earlier Old Testament texts the Bene Elohim were gods, but subsequently they became angels, the messengers. Malachim, whom Jacob sees going up and down a ladder, actually a celestial mountain between heaven and earth. In earlier works the messengers were anonymous, but in the Second Temple period 539 BCE to 100 CE they began to be given names, and eventually became the vast angelic orders of Christianity and Judaism. Thus the gods and goddesses who had once been the superiors or equals of Yahweh were first made his peers, then subordinate gods, and finally ended as angels in his service. <laughs> Paradise and the human soul There is no concept of a human soul, or of eternal life, in the oldest parts of the Old Testament. Death is the going out of the breath which God once breathed into the dust Genesis chapter 2 verse 7, all men face the same fate in Sheol, a shadowy existence without knowledge or feeling Job chapter 14 verse 13, Koholoth 9-5, and there is no way that mortals can enter heaven. In the centuries after the Babylonian exile, a belief in afterlife and post-death retribution appeared in Jewish apocalyptic literature. At much the same time the Bible was translated into Greek, and the translators used the Greek word paradisos paradise for the garden of God and paradise came to be located in heaven. <laughs> Earth <laughs> Cosmic geography In the Old Testament period, the Earth was most commonly thought of as a flat disk floating on water. The concept was apparently quite similar to that depicted in a Babylonian world map from about 600 BCE, a single circular continent bounded by a circular sea, and beyond the sea a number of equally spaced triangles called Nagu distant regions, apparently islands although possibly mountains. The Old Testament likewise locates islands alongside the earth, Psalm chapter 97 verse 1 these are the ends of the earth. According to Isaiah chapter 41 verse 5, the extreme edge of Job's circular horizon Job chapter 26 verse 10 where the vault of heaven is supported on mountains. Other OT passages suggest that the sky rests on pillars Psalm chapter 75 verses 3, 1 Samuel 2-8, Job chapter 9 verse 6, on foundations Psalms 18-7 and 82-5, or on supports Psalm chapter 104 verse 5, while the book of Job imagines the cosmos as a vast tent, with the earth as its floor and the sky as the tent itself, from the edges of the sky God hangs the earth over nothing meaning the vast ocean securely supported by being tied to the sky job chapter 26 verse 7 if the technical means by which yahweh keeps the earth from sinking into the chaos waters are unclear it is nevertheless clear that he does so by virtue of his personal power the idea that the earth was a sphere was developed by the greeks in the 6th century bce and by the 3rd century bce this was generally accepted by educated romans and greeks and even by some jews the author of revelation however assumed a flat earth in 7 to 1 Topic. Temples, mountains, gardens and rivers In the cosmology of the ancient Near East, the cosmic warrior god, after defeating the powers of chaos, would create the world and build his earthly house, the temple. Just as the abyss, the deepest deep, was the place for chaos and death, so God's temple belonged on the high mountain. In ancient Judah the mountain and the location of the temple was Zion Jerusalem, the navel and center of the world Ezekiel chapter 5 verse 5 and 38 to 12. 
The Psalms describe God sitting enthroned over the flood, the cosmic sea, in his heavenly palace. Psalm chapter 29 verse 10, the eternal king who lays the beams of his upper chambers in the waters. Psalm chapter 104 verse 3. The Samaritan Pentateuch identifies this mountain as Mount Gerizim, which the New Testament also implicitly acknowledges John chapter 4 verse 20. This imagery recalls the Mesopotamian god Ea who places his throne in Apsu, the primeval fresh waters beneath the earth, and the Canaanite god El, described in the Baal cycle as having his palace on a cosmic mountain which is the source of the primordial ocean, water springs, the point where heavenly and earthly realms join is depicted as an earthly garden of God, associated with the temple and royal palace. Ezekiel chapter 28 verses 12 to 19 places the garden in Eden on the mountain of the gods. In Genesis chapters 2 to 3 Eden's location is more vague, simply far away, in the east. But there is a strong suggestion in both that the garden is attached to a temple or palace. In Jerusalem the earthly temple was decorated with motifs of the cosmos and the garden, and, like other ancient Near Eastern temples, its three sections made up a symbolic microcosm, from the outer court the visible world of land and sea, through the holy place the visible heaven and the garden of God to the holy of holies the invisible heaven of God. The imagery of the cosmic mountain and garden of Ezekiel reappears in the New Testament book of Revelation, applied to the Messianic Jerusalem, its walls adorned with precious stones, the river of the water of life, flowing from under its throne Revelation chapter 22 verses 1 to 2, a stream from underground a subterranean ocean of fresh water, fertilizes Eden before dividing into four rivers that go out to the entire earth Genesis chapter 2 verses 5 to 6, in Ezekiel chapter 47 verses 1 to 12 see Ezekiel's temple and other prophets the stream issues from the temple itself, makes the desert bloom, and turns the Dead Sea from salt to fresh. Yet the underground waters are ambiguous, they are the source of life-giving rivers, but they are also associated with death Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 6 and Job chapter 38 verses 16 to 17 describe how the way to Sheol is through water, and its gates are located at the foot of the mountain at the bottom of the seas. <laughs> Underworld Topic. Sheol and the Old Testament Beneath the earth is Sheol, the abode of the Rephaim shades, although it is not entirely clear whether all who died became shades, or only the mighty dead. Compare Psalm chapter 88 verse 10 with Isaiah chapter 14 verse 9 and 26 to 14. Some biblical passages state that God has no presence in the underworld. In death there is no remembrance of thee, in Sheol who shall give thee thanks. Psalm chapter 6. Others imply that the dead themselves are in some sense semi-divine, like the shade of the prophet Samuel, who is called an Elohim, the same word used for God and gods. Still other passages state God's power over Sheol as over the rest of his creation. Though they the wicked, dig into Sheol, from there shall my hand take them. Amos chapter 9 verse 2 Topic Intertestamental period The Old Testament Sheol was simply the home of all the dead good and bad alike in the Hellenistic period the Greek-speaking Jews of Egypt, perhaps under the influence of Greek thought, came to believe that the good would not die but would go directly to God, while the wicked would really die and go to the realm of Hades, God of the underworld, where they would perhaps suffer torment. The Book of Enoch, dating from the period between the Old and New Testaments, separates the dead into a well-lit cavern for the righteous and dark caverns for the wicked, and provides the former with a spring, perhaps signifying that these are the living, i.e. a spring, waters of life. In the New Testament, Jesus's parable of the rich man and Lazarus reflects the idea that the wicked began their punishment in Hades immediately on dying. Topic. 
Satan and the End of Time The New Testament Hades is a temporary holding place, to be used only until the end of time, when its inhabitants will be thrown into the pit of Gehenna or the Lake of Fire Revelation chapter 20 verses 10 to 14. This lake is either underground, or will go underground when the New Earth emerges. The Satan does not inhabit or supervise the underworld, his sphere of activity is the human world, and is only to be thrown into the fire at the end of time. He appears throughout the Old Testament not as God's enemy but as his minister, a sort of attorney general with investigative and disciplinary powers, as in the book of Job. It was only with the early church fathers that he was identified with the serpent of the Garden of Eden and came to be seen as an active rebel against God, seeking to thwart the divine plan for mankind. <laughs> See also